I know we're starting slightly later than scheduled, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Simon Edge, who's our Cabinet Member for Prosperity and who leads the Transform of the Head initiative on behalf of Mole Valley District Council. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Autumn Update, the Autumn Public Forum. Uh, I'm just going to give a very quick introduction as to what we're going to be covering today, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, introduce Jonathan Sharrock, who's the Chief Executive of Coaster Capital, who is, uh, which, which body is one of our main funders. So uh, we'll be able to hear from him about Leatherhead in its, in its strategic context and its regional context. So Jonathan is going to start. We'll then have a little bit about the generalities of what Transform is, how it was created, and, uh, and, and, and some of the, the sort of technicalities. That's the usual sort of stuff I do at the beginning of any of these updates. So apologies to those of you who've heard it before. But of course, this is going out on a, on a live stream. There will be all sorts of people, perhaps some in the room, uh, but uh, hopefully people out there who've not heard that before, so it's important to cover that ground. Uh, as I've just alluded to, this event is being live streamed, it's being filmed, uh, so if, if you want to get up to anything dramatic, um, be aware that uh, you will be uh, preserved in, for posterity. Um, so we're going to do uh, Jonathan first. Uh, he'll do a little question and answer. He has to get off before the main question and answer at the end, so um, he'll do his earlier on because we don't want to uh, prevent you from having the opportunity to question him. Then we'll go around the, uh, around the slide here doing the, the usual sort of format updates and, and next steps on the various projects that we've got in hand. And then after question and answer from the rest of us, we will be closed with uh, a, a dance performance by the DeLions Dance Squad. The, the community entertainment aspect that we introduced at the last event seemed to go down very well, so we thought we'd do that again. So, on that note, I'll hand over to Jonathan and uh, let him entertain you. Be nice to him, he's a big funder. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, I wish I could think of a, of a witty observation to make about the dance thing, but I'm afraid I can't. So I'll start with uh, some talking and things will take off from there. Um, my name's Jonathan Sherrick and I'm the Chief Executive of Coaster Capital and I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk to you about uh, the work of our organisation, what we are planning to do in the next two years and specifically the, uh, the way that we see our regional economy and Leatherhead and Mole Valley in particular within that. Um, some of you will know Coaster Capital because we've been involved in the delivery of Transform Leatherhead up to now. But the uh, other thing to get across is the role that we have working with government over the next few years to identify further investment in our region and, and the way that we understand the regional economy works as part of that. Okay? Um, so I'll begin by explaining what Coaster Capital is and the area that we're describing when we talk about the region. So the government created local enterprise partnerships when it was elected in 2010, uh, which replaced the civil service in the region. Some of you may have known the regional development agencies, which were part of government and worked on regional development. Those were, were swept away in austerity and replaced by what the government calls LEPs. And the idea of LEPs, uh, local enterprise partnerships, is that we cover a geography which makes economic sense so we, we look at the, the geography in Coaster Capital, which is broadly encapsulated by the Brighton Main Line or the Southern Rail Service that you'll be familiar with. And although this is a politically complex geography, it's economically extremely coherent. So it represents the area from Bognor Regis to New Haven along the south coast, including Brighton and Hove, and then up the uh, railway line or the uh, motorway, if that's your preferred mode of transport, through Gatwick Airport and the towns around Gatwick Airport and up to Croydon. So politically, it is complex. It involves 18 local authorities. Economically, I'm sure you'll all recognize, it's an area that um, most people in the area use for travel, either to work or for leisure, and increasingly in terms of commuting to London. And our role as the LEP is to work with local authorities all across that area to understand the way the economy works 
And fundamentally, and the most important thing for you to understand is fundamentally, we're here to articulate our region to government and explain to government how this region works. Now, uh, you've probably, uh, most of you heard of the, the concept of the Northern Powerhouse, yes? And you've heard of the Midlands Engine, and you'll be aware of the elected mayors which are coming into place in other parts of England, as well as the devolved administrations and the Mayor of London who've been there for 20 years or so. And these are all part of the, uh, of the same agenda as us. They're there to represent their areas to government and maximize the investment that government makes in those cities and those parts of the country. And our role in Coastal Capital is to do exactly the same for this area that you can see here. Now, we don't have a directly elected mayor in this area, and that's very common outside the major cities. What we are instead is a, a business-led group with a majority of business people on the board working very closely with political leaders to make sure that the investment we make benefits our economy and our economic growth. And the investment that we've had so far is quite impressive. So the way that the, uh, the government works these days is money isn't distributed to regions by right. All money is competed for. So money goes to the areas that put forward the best cases for investment. And if you don't put forward a good case, you don't get much money. Um, and so far, uh, since we were created in 2011, Coastal Capital has administered uh, more than £300 million of public money. And we've invested that in infrastructure projects all across the region, including in, in this town. And we have also been responsible for European structural funds, a much smaller number because traditionally the southeast of England hasn't benefited very much from the European structural funds. And we also run something called the Growing Places Fund, which is a, a commercially orientated fund that we invest in growing companies to help them deliver jobs and grow the regional economy. So since we were created in, in 2011, we have uh, roughly £350 million of public money under, under our scrutiny. And uh, obviously, in delivering that, we operate to the very highest standards of transparency and uh, governance and details of all of the investments that we've made is available on our website for anyone to examine if they, if they want, and which we are accountable to government and parliament for. Uh, in July, we published our new strategy, which we call Gatwick 360, uh, for the year ahead, for the years ahead. And this sets out a strategy for how our region's economy will grow out to 2030. And what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is share our analysis in this and explain to you what we think are the, uh, are the challenges facing the regional economy going forward. Now, there, there are significant challenges, is the point to make. Um, and uh, you can see from the effort that we've put into the design of the document and the effort that we're putting into communicating it to you that we believe it's really important for our region now st to start to talk much more clearly to government about the challenges that we face. I think there can be an assumption when you talk about regional development that it's all about the north or it's all about cities or it's all about certain type of the country, uh, parts of the country. What we're here to do is explain what uh, Surrey, Sussex and the other parts of our area need in terms of investment. And I remind you again, in terms of doing that, we're in a very competitive world. Now that's why we've called our strategy Gatwick 360 because Fundamentally, our region is quite a complex region politically. There's 24 separate towns. We have a lot of distinct identities. The identity in Leatherhead is distinct from the identity in Croydon, is distinct from the identity in Rygate or Red Hill. And if we're going to break through on a national level, we need to talk about the things that government is interested in. And we believe that the airport is our fundamental regional asset. It's the thing that makes us completely different from any other region of England, and therefore the thing that we, we are particularly uh, focusing on in our communications. I'll, I'll introduce you to the regional economy. Um, I think the key thing to say is that our regional economy is relatively weak compared to the other parts of the southeast of England. So we might be the seventh largest economy in England by size, and our economy is £50 billion, which is roughly the same size as the economy of Wales. But actually, we're growing far more slowly than most other parts of the southeast. Um, the LEP next door to us, which covers West Surrey and Hampshire, is growing much more quickly than us. In fact, if we had grown at the same rate as them over the last seven years, our economy would be three billion pounds bigger than it is now. So we have a, a, a sense of, of uh, stalling, perhaps, in the regional economy. And when you look at some measures, the economy is, is going backwards and has been for some years. Um, we, we have also got to be aware 
to look at the image on the top right. And much of the growth in the, regional, in the national economy at the moment is coming from cities. And although most of the cities of England have a much smaller economic base than ours, they are growing significantly more quickly. And there's a real trend when we think about uh, the economy over the 21st century, that cities are where it's at. Cities are where service industries move to. Cities are where younger people want to live. Cities are where uh, there's a much uh, larger cultural um, opportunity than in many towns. And the challenge for us in the coastal capital area, as we're a region of towns, is how do we articulate our needs and our opportunities to the government. I'll run through some of the stats that back up those headlines. So what you can see here is how our economy has performed relative to the benchmark economies that we uh, compare ourselves to. So very consciously, we don't compare ourselves to cities. We compare ourselves to places like Cheshire and Warrington uh, in the northwest, or Bristol, Bath and Somerset in the west country, or the South Midlands, which is roughly the area around Milton Keynes, Bedfordshire, um, between Oxford and Cambridge. And what you can see from this graph is that over the last 20 years, our economy has declined relative to the national average. 20 years ago, our economy was 5% bigger than the national average. Now it's 5% smaller than the national average. That's measured in terms of output per head of workers working in the region. Meanwhile, our comparator economies have continued to grow. And you can see the other three, ours is the red line, the other three um, have all come out of recession and, uh, and, and driven ahead since the recession, whereas ours is still in decline. So this is a, a reasonably worrying situation and, and something which plays to the productivity of our economy and the amount of wealth that's generated here and is one of our main focuses in taking this forward. Another thing to bring to your attention is the um, very serious situation we face as a region in terms of house prices and house price affordability. So you, you'll all be aware of the big priority that the government is putting on uh, uh, what they call a housing crisis in England. Um, they have a benchmark of nationally, the, uh, the ratio between median income, so the average income, and the average house price. Nationally, it's somewhere around eight to one. In our area, the cheapest uh, authority, which is Crawley, is nine to one, and the most expensive, which is Epsom, is uh, nearly 17 to one. So we have a significant challenge in terms of people who don't already own a home not being able to afford uh, to get onto the housing ladder in terms of buying a house, and the same statistics are true in terms of being able to afford rent. So the challenge for us when we think about the economy is how can people afford to live here? And what are the, uh, what are the things that we need to do to keep on bringing workers, younger workers, people who can contribute to the economy going forward into the region. We're also conscious, and this graph brings it out through the coloured dots, of the real difference between people who earn their money in London and commute to London and people who work locally. And you can see from the red dots that if you commute, housing is more affordable. That's because London jobs pay roughly a third more than jobs in the local area do. And that, in turn, is why one in ten of our population commute to London every day. And not just from places like Leatherhead, which have always been uh, commuting destinations to London, but increasingly people are commuting from the south coast, from Brighton and Hove, from Worthing, from Chichester, up to London, in order to afford to pay their local housing, uh, their, lo their mortgage and their local rent. So we have a real issue of the sustainability of our regional economy because we do not have the transport capacity to allow an ever greater number of people to commute to London. We need to think as a region about where are the jobs in our region and how are we going to earn money in the region so that people can afford to live here. And this feels like a, a real challenge for the regional economy going forward. Now, specifically within this slide, um, and I hope you can see it well enough, there are two places in our region where it makes more sense to work locally than it does to commute. One of them is Crawley, and Crawley is the, 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 the area of our um, regional economy that generates the most wealth by, by a long way, and the other is Mole Valley, and specifically Leatherhead. So Leatherhead and Crawley are the two towns where there is significant local employment sufficient to uh, keep people working locally compared to commuting up to London. And that's why I'm so keen to come here tonight, because the work that you're doing uh, through Transform Leatherhead and the opportunities that we have of maintaining the Leatherhead economy at the level it is are very, very significant. 
and very different to other places. If we were having this discussion in Epsom, for example, or in Horsham or in Chichester, you know, these are economies where people are commuting en masse to London and, and the incentives and the challenges they have to keep people locally are very different. In turn, this dependence on commuting is having an impact on our business base. So this slide shows our region compared to our comparators in terms of where the jobs are. And if I said to you that only one in three jobs in our area are in small and medium-sized companies, you might be surprised, but that is the situation. You can see with the third line down, and you can see that the red bar, which is the small companies, and the pink bar, which is the medium companies, are significantly smaller than in other areas. And the reason for that is that there is a lot of evidence that we are not providing enough space for businesses to grow into. So there are many, many successful businesses in this region, many small companies. So a micro business is fewer than 10 people, and a small company is between 10 and 30. And we have a significant challenge of building enough space for small companies to grow and then to grow into medium-sized companies. And why does that matter? Well, micro-businesses are essential because self-employment and, and small firms are the lifeblood of any economy. But it's only small companies which tend to employ graduates, take on apprenticeships, export, and drive the economic growth that we're going to need over the next few years, particularly uh, as we go through Brexit and we become a much more international export-based economy. So as a region, we have a challenge of how are we going to help our small companies grow. It's not a, an unemployment challenge. It's a meeting our economic potential challenge. And if you think back to the decline we've had for 20 years, a lot of that is because we're not providing the space for companies to grow. In fact, we've lost 20% of our employment space just since 2010 because so much of it's being converted into flats. There's less and less room for businesses to grow. So this is a real challenge. If we can't provide the space and we can't provide the jobs for businesses to grow, people will either commute or they will leave and work elsewhere. And where will the basis of our economy be then? There is a lot of positive to say, and you'll find this in our strategy. You know, in spite of this difficult environment, we have a, a large number of sectors that are thriving. There are 13 subsectors in our region, which are nationally significant. So these are firms that are adapting to the changing economic climate and doing really well. And so we, we are confident that if we build more economic space, these firms will grow in Leatherhead, in Dorking, in any of the towns in our region. Um, we've, we've named our strategy around Gatwick because uh, we need a single reference point to sell the region into government. And for us, Gatwick ticks those boxes. Gatwick makes us unique as an area because of its international connectivity, because of the fact that it's at the heart of the whole regional economy, and because in terms of how we can increase the productivity of our economy, we believe it's the towns around Gatwick, including in Mole Valley, which have significant potential for growth and development. So we're very focused on doing the right thing to help that economy grow. And this is our vision. You know, if, if I were Andy Burnham or any of the other elected mayors, you'd, you'd see me talking about my great city, you'd see me talking about us as a global leader, trying to attract the Commonwealth Games or whatever it might be. You know, we're not doing that. For us, it's about the quality of life in our, in our towns and becoming known as a region, which is a great place to live in, and we'd all agree with that, and also a great place to work, and a place where the towns can grow and thrive and people can succeed. And we need a reason, frankly, to get this message across, because um, some of you will have heard of HS2, the new railway to London. So HS2 will be built in 2026. And what that will mean for us is that... Um, Birmingham will be roughly the same distance from London as Leatherhead in terms of time. But the difference is that Birmingham will have um, a train every five minutes. Each train will be a kilometre long. It'll go at 250 miles an hour and it'll carry 650 people. And we have to ask ourselves, given that house prices in Birmingham are about a third of what they are in East Surrey, um, what can we do so that my children and future generations can afford to come and live in this area rather than move to the cities of the North and the Midlands, which are going to really take off once HS2 is built. This is the challenge we face as a region, and this is what we're doing through this strategy. In our strategy, we've identified eight priorities, which I, I list here. I won't go through them all individually, but our pitch to government is that by investing in these priorities, we can develop uh, schemes that will help the, the, uh, the economy grow. And the government's very keen to do that and to do that. And we will have to do that before Brexit happens. So we have roughly 18 months to 
to identify these projects, develop business cases and do it. And the reason it's linked to Brexit is that when we leave the EU, money that's currently spent by Brussels on regional development will come back to the UK and it'll be spent by the Westminster government. So we need to make sure as a region that we're very well placed so that when ministers have that money to distribute, they're thinking of us and they're not just thinking of other places. And this is the framework within which we're working. The government calls it a local industrial strategy. You might have heard of the national industrial strategy. So what my organisation is doing over the next 18 months is beginning that negotiation with ministers to do that, working very closely with Mole Valley, with Surrey and with all our local government partners to make sure we identify the best schemes to make a difference. And that concludes my presentation. Um, you can find copies of our strategy on our website. It's called Gatwick 360, and if you Google Gatwick 360, you'll find it. Um, I'm very pleased to take questions. Having explained it to you once, I mean, my commitment is to keep coming back uh, until, you, uh, until you understand it. And as I've said in this discussion, Leatherhead has a fundamental role in our strategy because, as well as Crawley, it's one of the places where we can see a very strong business base and a real growth uh, potential for the region. So I'm very, very keen to get your feedback on that. Thank you very much. I can see a gentleman here. I'm slightly um, unable to see through the lights, so if I miss you, please wave your arms around. I can see a gentleman here and then a gentleman up there. So after you, please, sir. Thank you. Um, to what extent are the age demographics relevant in looking at the way uh, that the um, gross product of the LEP has not been expanding and has been falling behind the comparator yeah. LEPs? That's a good question. Um, we, they are relevant. Uh, they're certainly relevant. Um, so all of the trends in our region are for an ageing population with some exceptions. I mean, that's not true in Brighton or in Crawley or in Croydon, both all of which remain young, but everywhere else, it's clearly an aging population. And I think that um, that trend is forecast to continue. In terms of how the economy has performed over the last few years, there are some quite interesting things. So we're not a region of high unemployment, but we are, are a high, an area where there's a high proportion of economic inactivity. So people who don't work even though they are of working age. And roughly one in five of our workers of working age don't work. And we have a larger number of those who've taken early retirement than other regions. So, you know, that, that's a product of how the labour market's worked in the last 20 years, where people have had employers for a long period of time. They've been able to, you know, step away from the labour force earlier than the government wanted them to. And that probably won't be true in the future because working ages are... A, extending, people won't have one employer for life, and, so the, and, and also people won't own their own homes to the same extent. So the idea that people can kind of settle down sooner will change, and I think we have a disadvantage because much of the population, you know, has already achieved that. It, we're not the only place to have that problem, but it is a factor, yeah. And the gentleman up there. Yes. So the, if you didn't hear, the question was about the environmental impact of development and whether it was going to have a negative impact on Leatherhead. So I stand here without any concept of what the schemes will be that we put forward. I have to say that very clearly. You know, what we've set out here is our analysis of how the regional economy works. And over the next 18 months, we'll be working with the politicians in the area, particularly with their local plans in mind, as to what, which schemes might we put forward to government. And I'm acutely conscious of what you say. And actually, it is a characteristic not just of Leatherhead, but of the whole area. And if I go back to this slide, um, 
you know, if we were in Brighton or Chichester or New Haven, we would be talking about the South Downs National Park right on our doorstep. If we were in Croydon, we would be talking about the Green Belt um, all around Croydon. And of course, here in East Surrey, we have the issues that you've described. So I'm very, very conscious of that. But I don't believe that growth and environmental protection are, are incompatible. Far, far from it. I think we need to make sure that we're investing in the environment and we're protecting and enhancing the quality of the towns because we have to make sure that we retain our competitive advantages, don't we, in economic terms. And our competitive advantage is the one that you described. If you go to my eight themes, you will see very clearly that number three is the investment in sustainable growth. And we know from government, from the changes that Michael Gove is making and the changes that Brexit will bring, that the agenda around the environment is going to become much more important to the future of the British economy. There will be no subsidies for farmers, for example. So farmers won't be subsidised to grow things. They will be subsidised and incentivised to deliver environmental outcomes. We know that we have land that's currently farmed that will not be farmed. We know that we have an energy crisis and we need to um, think about how we generate energy in a clean way. There are a number of things that are going to become much more important for the region in a new economy, and our region is very well placed to deal with those things. But in terms of schemes, and Leatherhead in particular, there are none. That was what we have to do over the next 18 months. We've had a question uh, via Facebook saying, uh, asking, what about Crossrail 2? Surely that would benefit us. I completely agree. Crossrail 2 is a huge opportunity. And I haven't had a chance to talk about everything. But under our transport strategy, getting an investment in Crossrail 2, which will put Epsom that much closer to London, have a massive benefit to um, Dorking and Leatherhead as well, is a fundamental opportunity. I completely agree. Now, there was a gentleman... Um, so I'm slightly constrained. There's a lady at the front here, and then I think a gentleman up there, so... Um, I know you mentioned about the office buildings being turned into flats, and I know that's not local policy that's driving that in many cases. But what, what can we do to influence that locally? Because there are several that I can think of that are still sitting empty that are up for rent or up for sale for business purposes that aren't yeah. getting filled. That's a great question. And, and um, of course, many of the offices that have gone are because they're not viable as offices anymore, so they become uh, flats instead. I think the challenge for us as a region is that just having offices isn't necessarily enough. You know, the way that the economy is changing, the pace of change is very quick. And actually the need of businesses in five years' time will probably be very different from the need of businesses 50 years ago when the offices were built. You know, it's all about the rise of the service industries. It's all about uh, technological innovation. There will be huge changes, you know, in terms of how transport works, in terms of people's expectation of work whether people want to live um, where they work or whether they want to commute. You know, I think it's worth remembering one in three people who work at the moment are um, from the new generation, from the millennial generation that was, that was born since the, uh, in the 90s. And, and their expectations of work are completely different to my generation. So what the workspace of the future is, we don't quite know. But we do know that, when, that there are large numbers of businesses in these sectors, very large numbers of businesses in these sectors based in our region who want to have a new factory space, a new office space to grow and they haven't got, they can't find it and they're leaving and they're going to the West Midlands and they're going to the Solent and they're going to Kent where areas are delivering office space and business space in much higher numbers. So I think a large part of my message to you is the competitive environment that we're in as a region. You know, people don't have to live in Surrey and Sussex. They can live anywhere they want. And if we want to keep people coming here, then we need to make sure that we're creating an environment where business can grow. Um, a, a question over here, and then the lady there. Yes. Um, talking about drilling in Mole Valley, this fracking, which is just outside Dorking, uh, our local MP seems to be for it, when really he should be against it. Uh, putting it in the most beautiful part of Surrey. Up north, they're trying to stop it. I think it's dreadful the government is allowing it to go ahead. They should put a stop to it altogether. I don't think Surrey really wants it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. And um, as an organisation, we don't have any statutory role. We're not a planning authority. We're not a, any kind of permitting authority. 
And they just want to... They've got a licence from the government to carte blanche. OK. And I think it's dreadful. OK. Um, and then the lady here. There's a microphone just behind you, actually. Yeah. Um, around Leatherhead, we understand there is a traffic um, survey coming shortly. But from what you're saying, it sounds to me as if a traffic survey is needed throughout the coast to capital region to encourage all these businesses. And I can't understand why something hasn't appeared on paper, either for the whole region or for our local region as well. You mean a road traffic survey? Yes, I do. Sorry, yes. Okay. Um, so I, I don't agree that road traffic is the biggest issue facing the region. I think the biggest issue, the biggest transport issue facing the region is rail capacity in terms of our economic productivity because actually, as well as the 120,000 people who commute to London every day, as I've described, most of the traffic that's coming to and from the major employment centres is by train. And that does include Leatherhead. I mean, I came into Leatherhead on the train myself a couple of weeks ago, and, and the trains are full. And I think one of the interesting things about the way the future economy is going to go is the, the change in car use that we're going to see. So what we currently take as a norm in terms of driving our own car from home to destination is highly likely to change okay. within, within the next five to ten years. I'm sorry, I just didn't mean to interrupt. Um, how are you going to improve or um, augment, then, the rail traffic? I was thinking chiefly of all the tiny little roads that we have in Surrey, which are very quaint, but get very, very clogged up, and you can't get two cars past, let alone a bus sometimes. But, all right, put that on one side. What about the trains, then? How are you going to increase capacity Excel there? Excellent question. So we, we have two major priorities where there are, there are two schemes in our region which are of national significance, and we absolutely have to make sure that ministers take the right decision. So one of them is Crossrail 2, which has been identified, which will be a transformational rail scheme for East Surrey, and the other relates to the um, Brighton Main Line. Now, the Brighton Main Line is all the train tracks used by Southern, and that is a service that you'll all be familiar with. Um, the key point in terms of investment is that all of those trains converge on Croydon. So every southern train goes through Croydon. And the, uh, the bridge north of Croydon, which is called the Windmill Bridge Junction, is a 60, 70-year-old piece of infrastructure that desperately needs to be overhauled. So we are working very hard with Network Rail to get that onto the government's national investment agenda. It'll be a rail scheme of national significance, probably in the region of one and a half to two billion pounds. And if we can do that, that will provide significantly more capacity on our rail network because it'll allow more trains to run more quickly to Croydon and from Croydon to Leatherhead, to Dorking, to Brighton and everywhere else in the region. My pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm okay, uh, we could discuss that offline if you like. Um, a gentleman here. What is the criteria for investing in Mull Valley? The money that you seem to have spent or given to Mull Valley, according to most of the local inhabitants, has been misspent. So the criteria for investment is relates to the, the way that the Treasury constructs business cases for investing in public money. So the investments that we make are what they call Green Book compliant, and all of the business cases that we have endorsed are available on our website. So we have invested in 87 projects all across the region of various sizes, and uh, full details of how those decisions have been taken are, are publicly available. Is it, is it public I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm being... Um, silenced, but maybe we can we could talk offline if you like. I very much enjoyed this evening. Thank you for listening to me. Bye bye. Well a very big thank you to Jonathan for, for that presentation. Certainly an awful lot of food for an awful lot of thought for all of us. Looking at, ah, we'll have to, there we go. 
So Jonathan's talked to us about Leatherhead and its position in a wider regional sense. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to just sort of zoom in again and, and look at Leatherhead from the, from the local context. Transform Leatherhead was, was born out of uh, a number of years of consultation and many thousands of responses from local people in order to develop the master plan. The key projects that are in the master plan are what people asked for to create a vision of a modern market town. We're not talking about the same sort of numbers that Jonathan's able to play with, but uh, it's a multi-million pound program and it's going to take a number of years. But we have to work within the constraints of things like the local plan. Now, the council is in the process of uh, rewriting its local plan. It's called uh, Future Mole Valley. And when it's adopted by the council, it will, we will have to work within it in everything that we do with, uh, with transforming the overhead. But one policy we are expecting or anticipating to see in the new plan is one about redeveloping town centres. Another thing I'd like to mention is the economic prosperity strategy that the council adopted uh, earlier this year. The EPS is all about um, supporting business across Mole Valley, um, but it also particularly uh, relates to Leatherhead in, uh, in three particular ways. First is uh, our business ref uh, reference group pilot. The idea here is that we're going to try and make Mole Valley a little bit more business orientated, a little bit more business conscious, and take soundings from a panel of uh, business people from all sizes of, uh, of business across the spectrum and across the, the district in order to help us do that. But we want to start that off in Leatherhead because we're a little bit further advanced here in terms of Transform Leatherhead and the, ref and the relationship that we've got with the Chamber and, and businesses. Um, so we announced at the last forum that we'd do a pilot. Um, that we had some very positive interest over the summer, which is great. And we're looking to get the first meeting off the ground uh, sometime next month. Uh, we have a date penciled in, but uh, we haven't actually invited the businesses yet, so subject to their being available, um, we will have the, the first meeting uh, next month. We've also launched our Economic Spotlight quarterly uh, newsletter. Now, this is all about sharing business news and information, uh, particularly about Transform, and it will contain all sorts of different business statistics to help businesses plan and to know where they are in the grand scheme of things. So, vacancy rates for buildings, employment levels, earning rates, that sort of thing. And finally, I'd like to mention the business inquiry service, which we're running through an organization called CoStar, which is going to be useful in signposting opportunities to businesses as to where they can find premises. <coughs> but when we look at Transform Leatherhead, I think it's very helpful to think about what and who actually make a successful market town. Three things have to come together, people, infrastructure, and the businesses in a virtuous circle. So starting with people, um, Leatherhead identifies as a town, but it's actually got a relatively small population at, uh, according to the 2016 census of uh, about 11 and a half thousand. Whereas places like Bookham and Ashdead that identify themselves as villages have populations of 11,300 and 14,200 respectively. But Leatherhead does have a very large inflow of commuters, something like 9,000 a day. And it also benefits from a very large uh, catchment area of something like 370,000 people are within a 20-minute journey. The weekly expenditure that those families have is £181 per week, compared to a national average of 147. So Transform Leatherhead will certainly grow the population, but those people must be encouraged to want to actually shop in Leatherhead and do their business in Leatherhead, not go elsewhere and not go uh, and, and do things online. So the next one down is infrastructure, and that's where the council and Transform come in. We're looking at making sure that the transport system works, that uh, parking is available, that the built environment feels safe and welcoming to people, that we can attract anchor retail and leisure, and that there is a destination feel and a destination facilities that you'd expect in, in, in such a place available when you get here. And of course, all that has to be communicated. And then we get to retail, leisure, and business. Those businesses have to produce things or sell things or provide things that, that people want. They have to provide good service, good price, good quality. They have to be able to adapt to economic changes and trends. 
But the good news is that people will travel to destinations, shops, restaurants, and, and businesses, and, and, and leisure. So we have the makings there. We have to generate this, this virtuous circle. I also think it's helpful to look at uh, the connection between Leatherhead's something like 240 million pounds of uh, key projects and the positive effects that we want them to deliver. So looking across the various quarters, the Riverside Quarter, which is Clare and James House, the Riverside Park, and flood alleviation. The effect we're looking for here is to generate a new gateway to the town. It should be attractive, an attractive area in its own right and provide leisure facilities. We're looking for flats. We're looking to get people into the area. We're looking for food and drink, new circulation links, and connectivity to the other quarters. And the retail leisure, at retail and leisure quarter, which is Church Street, Swan Centre, and the Town Centre Public Realm. Here we're looking to get anchors in, in terms of retail and leisure. We're looking for flats and people, new circulation uh, links, and again, connectivity, but also office and business space, and possibly a new hotel. Then we, when we go to the urban quarter, which is uh, transport and parking study that we're doing, and uh, sustainable transport, uh, together with the Red House Gardens and uh, Bull Hill development. We're looking again for better traffic movement, car parking, alternative transport like bus, rail and bike. We want new links and connectivity again, new circulation, homes for people, and possibly again a new hotel, but certainly also office and business employment. So when we combine all these things, we end up with a much stronger population, we end up with greater footfall locally within the town, and with those people having better access to retail, leisure, the destination feel and features that, that they want within a safe environment. That, we feel, is going to boost the economy, and that, in turn, will deliver the Leatherhead, uh, Transform Leatherhead vision of a friendly, vibrant, lively, mar modern market town. I also wanted to provide a reminder of, of how we balance what we do. Anything, any project that we have has to meet these three tests. It has to create a positive change. It has to meet, so it has to contribute to meeting the objectives of the Transform Leatherhead Master Plan. It has to produce a community benefit, which is something that's perhaps wider than Leatherhead, but reaches out to uh, the other towns and villages around. And of course, it's also got to make economic sense. We're using public money, and we cannot set out to make a loss in what we do. And like it or not, Transform Leatherhead is a complex program of work. As I've said, 240 million pounds worth of schemes over something like 10 years. It all has to be properly planned. It all has to be properly managed. Now, if I had a magic wand, things could happen an awful lot faster than they do. But I don't. And it's very important that in everything we do, we act according to the law. We follow rules, regulations, standards, policies for things that involve consultation, planning, conservation, the environment, finance, not to mention the physical reality that we run up against every now and again when we try and do something, or um, the, the unexpected. It happens. So each key project's progress is planned. Uh, planned out over the next few years, as, as shown on this slide. This is on the internet if you want to go and have a look at it. Um, and, the, and the process is constantly developing, being updated. But the other thing I'd like uh, to ask everybody to remember is that our projects are interrelated. They need to enable or respond to other program projects within the program. And this affects the order of what we do and the timing of what we can do. If you look at this particular slide, you can see how central the transport modelling and options appraisal project is to the developments at the Swan Centre, Bull Hill and Red House Gardens, and in terms of the public realm and car parking. So with that, we can now go on and have a look at the updates for the individual quarters, starting with the Riverside, Clare and James House. We had the public consultation between the 12th and the 27th of July on our outline proposals. And the proposals were viewed hundreds of times on the internet, and we had 89 people visit the exhibitions and generated 118 f feedback forms uh, of, of, of people's views. So thank you all. I know some of you here provided those views, so thank you all for doing that. We ended up with a very positive support, actually, for the, for the redevelopment of the building and for the Riverside Park. 
Where people had concerns, it was over the height and scale of the building and also the, uh, the amount of parking that was going to be provided. Now, those responses have all been considered by the design team as they are revising the proposals. The next steps are that we're going to be targeting submission of an outline planning application next month. Uh, and the intention there is that it will enable uh, the planning committee to make a determination somewhere in March 19. The revised proposal anticipates having fewer units, so fewer flats within the block, a better parking ratio, and reduced impact, particularly in terms of the uh, shadowing of the Running Horse pub. As I said, the recommendations to councillors uh, will come in, in in March, but we're also going to be looking to uh, identify our development partner. The, the model we're using for this particular development is that we will take it up to the uh, uh, outline planning application and then we will work with a development partner who will take the financial risk, frankly, in, in terms of building the, the development. Uh, and that, we're hoping, will be able to start in early 2019. So. The next one is the Riverside Park. Um, the concepts for this were laid out in the Clare and James House proposals, and they consist of uh, a ground floor cafe, including outdoor seating, and an informal children's play area using uh, materials that are sympathetic to uh, a, a Riverside setting. Landscape design of, of, of planting to create what I would call a nice area, what the, the jargon calls a mosaic of open spaces. Ooh. And that's going to uh, extend the opportunities for, for wildlife and biodiversity. Any tree loss will be compensated for by a replanting scheme. Now, of course, we can't do all of this without doing ecological surveys um, of, of this area and the wider area affected. So those were commissioned in June 2018, and they're currently underway. The next project is to do with uh, flood alleviation. Now, the Environment Agency wrote to all the residents who were going to be uh, benefiting from the temporary flood defences that they had in place, and they were invited to go along to the uh, River Mole Discovery Day on the 30th of September, where there was a demonstration of a, of a fully set up uh, section of, of the barrier. Um, so they all have an idea of what it looks like and how it's going to work. And this is going to be uh, obviously ready for deployment this winter. In terms of the wider Leatherhead and Fetcham flood alleviation scheme, the Environment Agency are finalising uh, their detailed appraisal of the various options to reduce the risk of flooding. You'll remember that uh, at an update or two ago, uh, we thought that that was going to be a straightforward process, but as usual, it, it, was, it turned out to be far more complicated than that. So the update of the flooding model for the River Mole has been developed and a new model created, and there is also a new model for the surface water flow uh, and system in Fetcham. My understanding is that the Environment Agency are planning to put on a, a public exhibition so that everybody can come along and have everything explained to them. Um, we are waiting for a time and date for that to be confirmed, but I'm hoping that it won't be too far off. So, moving on to the, uh, the Swan Centre. You remember here that we've got uh, some shorter term works and some longer term works that we're undertaking. In terms of the short term, we started in uh, 1st of September and we're due to finish later this month, refurbishing the toilets and making car park levels one to four far more user friendly. Now that's on target for completion. We've, uh, the old toilets have gone, uh, new layout is complete and the floor and wall tiling is being done this week. Levels one and two and most of three are complete. They've had a full paint job, re-signing, resurfacing uh, in the new Swan Centre colours. And the chamfering of the curbs, which is, uh, and the bullnose sections at the front of each ramp, uh, the chamfering back of those, or the cutting back of those, is almost complete, uh, with levels four and five actually due to be completed today, I believe. We're going to have a break um, so that we avoid any negative impact that uh, the car parking works might have had over the shopping uh, period for Christmas. And we're going to uh, resume in mid-January carrying on with levels five and six to make them more user friendly, and then replacing the lifts. Uh, that's two passenger lifts and two goods lifts will be replaced in that phase. That'll take us up to the end of May, and then once the lifts are done, we'll be able to reconfigure the stairwell and create a new uh, retail unit. 
In the longer term, uh, we have had the Swan Centre Development Strategy and Viability uh, Study undertaken. This was by a firm called Cushman and Wakefield who uh, were introduced and, and spoke at the last update. Now they've done a lot of research and they've produced some key market messages which are very similar to the sort of things that Jonathan was talking about earlier on. National retailers are focusing on flagship locations and by that we understand them to mean their top 50 sites. They're also focusing on online sales. Well-known brands and particularly fashion are focusing on larger prime shopping locations, so places such as Guildford, Kingston, London, Blue Water and, and Westfield. And what this means is that leather, Leatherhead is going to have to focus on a greater mix of uses. That greater mix of use is crucial to generate footfall and vitality and can be done through focusing on convenience and independent retail, additional market trading, increased leisure use, um, things like cinema, hotel, food and beverage, and we have had strong interest in Leatherhead from a number of cinema operators. Also, the introduction of residential and flexible workspace, again, the sort of thing that Jonathan was referring to earlier, so that we can get people working in the town as well as living and uh, enjoying the leisure opportunities. And also, community use. So, what are the next steps? Well, Cushman and Wakefield have scoped and uh, evaluated uh, the viability of a number of options, everything from very light touch, uh, basically the sort of do-nothing option, which, uh, which is not what we're after, given that we're looking to transform the place, uh, to the what they call whole-scale redevelopment, which to the rest of us means knock it down and start again. The initial findings suggest, and, and I, I would like to emphasise the word, emphasize the word initial, um, that a whole-scale redevelopment as a shopping centre is just simply not viable. The, uh, the, the, thick, the, the numbers simply don't stack up and there isn't the demand there from, from the retailers. On the other hand, encouragingly, low and medium intervention options are viable and they include intensification of business, retail, market, leisure and residential, a wider mix of use incorporating all of the above, a proportionate increase in car parking provision and improvements to the public realm. Now, the recommended development option that, or options that they're going to provide to the council will come in and be considered early uh, 2019. And we're hoping to be able to provide uh, a much fuller update uh, to the next uh, forum as, as to what some of that might look like. Moving on to public realm and the high street, um, in terms particularly of the two buildings that the council bought earlier in the year, um, Phase one of the works to 21 High Street are complete, and we're thinking of putting a planning application in for change of usage for the upper floors of 23 High Street uh, sometime soon. We're targeting occupiers who are independent, speciality food or leisure, and as requested by the people of Leatherhead, we're looking for butchers. So far, we've had interest from uh, a fitness company to, look, to take over the upper floor of 23 High Street, and an independent clothing retailer is looking at uh, 21 High Street. I'd also at this point like to give a plug for the Leatherhead Events Working Group, which is coordinated by the Swan Centre Management Agent that we employ, and involves um, stakeholders such as the theatre, churches together, town centre traders and business. There's, there's lots going on in, in, in terms of events to provide a broader offer and greater footfall. Things like children's activities during the holiday, uh, Magic Mondays, for example, health and wellbeing events like Stoptober, monthly markets and speciality markets, such as the French market, Halloween, which is the, the picture that's on the screen, and the uh, World War I centenary event organized by the Royal British Legion uh, with the Swan Center. There's also Light Up, Leatherhead, and Christmas. Uh, I've already mentioned the, uh, the business reference group, so I won't go over that again. And I will come on to talk about last night's meeting with uh, High Street Businesses uh, in, a, in a later slide. So, looking back at the bigger picture in terms of public realm, the strategy for this is going to have to follow the, and, and work out from the options that we come out with the Transport Modelling Study and the Swan Centre Feasibility Study. Once they've been identified, we'll be able to make progress on this. But we are doing things in the near term, and uh, having 
uh, coming out of our discussions with Surrey County Council, we're going to uh, work with them to repair the walling of the, the ramp at the foot of the high street, also known as the, the waterless feature. We're going to be having free car parking from 3 o'clock onwards on the 31st of October for the Halloween event. Free parking all day on the three Saturdays pre-Christmas, that's the 1st, the 8th and the 15th, with the, the first being the date of the Christmas event. And Surrey County are also proposing a signage review so that uh, we get clearer directions for people as to where the car parks are, where the market is, what day the market is on, and, and wayfinders for shoppers once they're in the town as to how, the, how to get from A to B. Now, looking towards the, the urban quarter, so Bull Hill, Red House Gardens, and, and transport, beginning with transport. If we're going to increase Leatherhead's population, get more people into the town to work, shop, and, and play, we absolutely have to consider a rather large number of transport factors in the town and how they spread out into the towns and villages, into the surrounding roads and villages. Things like the impact of the volume of private cars, lorries, cycle, traffic generally, journey peak times, business needs, sustainable and public transport options, and public safety to name but a few. And we also have to consider the proper process for proposing, consulting on, and then making those changes. Now, traffic and parking are very emotive topics, and these are things that can't be shortcut or dismissed. Again, the magic wand for that hasn't yet been invented. So as I said at the Spring Forum, we're working on three key projects. Firstly, as part of the local plan, we're feeding into the Surrey County Council model called uh, Sintram. This is identifying strategic areas of traffic problem uh, around the whole of Surrey, but particularly for us in our area. Once they've been prioritised, the county will then be able to look at funding improvement schemes. We've commissioned WSP to produce us uh, a, a traffic model looking at peak time, going everywhere from Junction 9 in the north down to the A246 and the A24 in the south. The slide shows the roads that are covered and the data collection points. The data collection was done in June, and it included a variety of surveys, uh, including manual classified counts, automatic traffic counts, automatic number plate recognition, and also car park interviews of people who were shopping, uh, stopping and, and, and shopping. The model is due to be completed by the end of this year, and that is on target as, as we had hoped. We're also commissioning uh, a high street economic study to collect data on, surprisingly, the, econ the economics of the, of the high street, public realm, and highway safety. Quotes have been received, and we'll be putting that into effect as, as soon as the procurement process is, is completed. So with the models and the study in place, we'll be able to review short and long-term options and then be able to consult on them. Fairly quick update on sustainable transport. Um, people who've been to or, or watched these events before will know that this is one that's consistently we've, we've struggled with to actually get off the ground. We're not giving up. We're going to continue to pursue sustainable transport as a concept and any schemes that we uh, find that are sustainable and, and workable. Uh, in the immediate future, Network Rail are releasing funds um, to, uh, to, to make smaller stations more accessible, and it's, they're calling it Access for All. Together with Govia Thameslink, we've put in a bid, and uh, Network Rail will be assessing all of the bids that it's received across the country and will notify the, the successful stations in April of next year. We're also reviewing sustainable transport routes, and this time we're looking at it as a package involving cycling, walking, and bus routes together and seeing what additional funding that uh, can, be, can be got for those. So in terms of sustainable transport overall, watch this space, we're, st we're still working on it. A similar sort of update on Red House Gardens and Bull Hill. We're making progress, if you remember the dependency network I showed earlier, we're making progress on the projects that will take us towards options for Bull Hill, and those are things like the Swan Centre long-term viability study, the transport studies, and wider strategies of the council like the local area or the local plan and the uh, potential for a local area action plan within that. So there aren't any developments at this, uh, this stage that I can tell you about the, uh, the particular scheme, but we are moving inexorably towards it. 
Uh, I can't uh, move on from public realm and transport without mentioning high street parking. As many of you will know, there's been a parking petition, which uh, is, is shown on the slide, to Surrey County Council's local committee. Now, we're all very sympathetic to the fears and frustrations of the high street and, and of residents. That's why we're, we, we are regenerating Leatherhead. At the Spring Forum, we confirmed that we would be looking at traffic and parking options during this year and said that it was a complex issue. Now, I've already mentioned the near-term high street measures, including repairs, events, and periods of free parking to support the high street, and also that we're phasing the work in the Swan Centre to make sure that we don't interrupt Christmas trading. I've also mentioned the work that we're doing with the county in terms of its Sintram model, the WSP model, and the work we're specifically doing on looking at the economics of the high street. And again, with all these models in place, we'll be able to review the short and long-term options and then start consulting on the, on the viable ones. Surrey County Council's uh, local committee response to the petition is awaited, but last night we hosted, together with the county, a very valuable meeting with uh, uh, businesses in the uh, Mango Bean Cafe. I'll give them an advert there. Um, all businesses that had signed the petition were invited, and uh, we were very pleased to see the ones that came. I, I thought, and uh, I know my colleague Tim Hall from the county, uh, thought it was a very successful event. We had lots of views shared, and, and they were constructively shared, which was appreciated as well. There are, however, things that still need to be addressed. Uh, they include a safety review, as there are risks uh, to pedestrians, especially children, of, of the proposal. We have to consider new Department for Transported advice that has come out, uh, and, and very recently, as in the last week, about not having what they call shared surfaces, which means to us, pedestrianised areas that, uh, that cars can come through as well. So we're going to have to work through that and digest it. We have to think about congestion and obstruction for other users' access, potential confusion over the, the signage and the enforcement arrangements for any new uh, regulations that come in, and also the, the budget and the costs for all of these things. Then we've got to work out how it all fits together with Transform and the plans that we have there. So officers are developing a project plan and they're going to continue to engage with the businesses. Yesterday was, was not a one-off, it was a, a first step. And, uh, and other stakeholders, because uh, there are, is a diversity of views as to what is the right thing to do. And I'm very pleased that this evening we've got uh, Surrey County Councillor Colin Kemp and uh, Highways Officer Richard Bolton on the panel for our question and answer session. I'd like to finish this particular slide with, with a, a, a sort of plea for support for Transform Leatherhead. We know things aren't perfect. We know there's a, a great desire for change. As I've said before, that's why we're doing Transform. Transform's all about creating the circumstances for the town and the high street to thrive. It's a comprehensive package. It's not a pick-and-mix affair. But sadly, there are no quick-fix solutions, however much we would like there to be. So it's vital that we celebrate the good things about Leatherhead. For example, according to uh, CoStar, the company that we use, statistics, in September 2018, the vacancy rate for retail space in Leatherhead, measured in square footage, was 4.2%. That compares to a southeast average of 3.8%. So we're behind, but we're not that far behind. In Horsham, which is a town that a lot of people like to compare us to, it was 3.4. But in Dorking, 5.2, Epsom, 14.8, and Cobham, 16.1. So in comparison, we're not doing as badly as people might think. Well done, Leatherhead. Let's celebrate that. So it's great to see the passion that there is for the high street out there. But as I've said, let's celebrate the positive steps that are being taken and encourage people and new businesses to invest in Leatherhead. Let's not put them off with negativity and doom mongering. So here's the summary of, of the key milestones for the rest of this year and, and next as they currently stand. For the Riverside Quarter, we want to get the outline planning application in for Clare House and James House redevelopment. We want to select a partner to do the uh, detailed planning application and the actual building work with us. And we're looking forward to the Environment Agency's update on flood alleviation options. 
In terms of the retail and leisure quarter, we're looking forward to completing the Swan Centre refurbishment in the summer of, the, of next year. We're very much looking forward to the report on the long-term viability of the Swan Centre and the options that might come from that in the early part of next year. And we're also looking forward to working with Surrey County Council's local committee and with High Street traders on the response to the High Street petition. In the urban quarter, we are wanting to complete the transport model and the economic study of the High Street to identify viable options and then to feasibility test those options and also to work on grant funding applications, particularly with Coast to Coast, but also with others that, uh, that we can uh, work with to get money from. As is traditional at these events, I'm quite happy to give a plug to Arts Alive. The, the Arts Alive Festival is, is always a, a mainstay of, of, of the area and uh, it's looking really good. I'm not sure if Raj is in the, in the house tonight, um, but we've, we've got support from the chairman of the, of the council. He's the one on the, uh, your left, uh, just under the balloons. And that's also very much appreciated. We've got the Halloween event on the 31st of October and we've got the Christmas event on the 1st of December. As is also traditional, the, the thank you slide for all the people and the organisations that we work with and who give us their comments and who we interact with uh, over the last few months in, in working through Transform Leatherhead and an apology to anybody that uh, we've missed off. So, we're now going to move on to the question and answer stage. Uh, you've, you've got me, you recognise me. Next is uh, Andrew Ward, who is uh, Mole Valley's Investment and Regeneration Manager. We then have Emma Day, who is Mole Valley's Executive Head of Service covering Prosperity, and she will be taking the David Dimbleby seat and uh, uh, marshalling the questions. And we have Richard Bolton, who is the Local Highway Services Group Manager for Surrey County Council, and Councillor Colin Kemp, who is the Surrey County Council Cabinet Lead Member for Place. I'm going to skip over that while we're doing the Q&A, because I wanted to, to put up the, the thank you and stay in touch uh, slide uh, <laughs> long enough so that you could either learn it or take a photograph of it or copy it down while we're answering the question. So I'll leave that up there so you, uh, if you want to make any notes or do anything, you are able to do that. So I think that's it. And if we're all ready, I will cross the floor and we can start doing questions. Right, so for those of you who've been to one of our forums before, this is when we open up the floor to questions from anybody who has something they would like to discuss with the panel. We can't always um, respond to everyone's questions on the night, so what we absolutely commit to do is that we will pick up any un unanswered questions and deal them and publish written answers on our website. So Natalie, I think there's a lady with a pink jacket on who's got her hand up already. Good evening. Um, I'm the chairman of the Fez Fez Leatherhead and Fetcham Flood Action Group. I am disappointed to hear so little said about flood alleviation. Mm -hmm. It is really interesting, the ideas that you have, especially in the Riverside Quarter. However, if we don't have decent alleviation on the river, a lot of that will go underwater and it will be a waste of money. I would like to know how much money you have set aside to put into flood alleviation. Thank you for your question. Um, the Environment Agency are hosting an exhibition. As we said tonight, it's planned to happen in December. We are as well. Yes, we are part of that. that's right. So I met Nick Philport and Andy Irvin today. The purpose of the exhibition is to give a general update on what options are available to better protect Leatherhead and Fetcham. It is a complicated issue. And to date, Mulvey District Council has not ring-fenced any funds to invest in flood alleviation. And I think when we hear what the options available are, that will be one of the questions that needs to be answered, is how the different options that are available can be funded. And it will be through a mixture of partner funding. Typically, it's Surrey County Council as the lead flood authority, DEFRA, through the Environment Agency, 
and the uh, water companies similarly invest in their infrastructure. But tonight, I can't really give you a full update. That will come in December when the EA hosts their exhibition. So there's a gentleman in the front with a red jumper on. Do you have a microphone? I think it's on its way down to you now, sir. It's just coming down the side to you. Uh, we've heard that Claire James and uh, Claire, Claire House and James House outline planning application is being submitted next month. We've also heard that there will be fewer units mm -hmm. planned. Can we have more detail on how, how the development is being cut down? Can yes. I hand over to my colleague Andrew Ward to answer yes, that question? Certainly. Um, after having a pre-app discussion with Historic England um, and taking into account their verbal communication with us, and indeed having had discussions with our Mole Valley um, planning colleagues, um, we have scaled it back, and we've scaled it back to 43 units. That's where we are at presently. 43 units, of which 12 will be affordable. And how high will the, how high will the building be? The building, um, we, one of the things that came back from the very valuable public um, consultation in July, which Simon mentioned, was that the public in particular wanted to see a varied roof line. So we've tried to take that on board, and indeed we have taken it on board. And one of the things we've taken on board from Historic England is the fact that we had to step back away from the running horse public house, which, as you will all know, is listed, grade two listed, and indeed consider the aspect of the um, listed bridge, which is the all-important entry point into the town centre. So to answer your question, we've still got, we've, we've got a very brief line, um, which um, goes six, seven, seven, six. And then it goes five and four at the back, going back towards the running um, horse public house. So we've scaled it back from the pub and we've given a varied roof line to respond to the feedback that we've received. What I would like to emphasise um, is that we're still waiting for formal pre-application advice from Historic England who are the statutory consul team in respect of heritage, so the Running Horse Pub and the Bridge. We're also waiting for formal feedback from our colleagues within the planning teams. So at this point, we are targeting submission in November, but we cannot submit that until we've had that formal advice back in, because if that advice is not supportive, we will not submit that outline planning application. So it's just to, just to make that clear, that's where we are at present. We've shared with you the information, which is the current design. Again, until we've had that formal advice back, the scheme may have to change again. So that's just the current position. Have you, have you increased the spaces? Um, Bear with me a second, we need to get a mic to you. Um, let me take that question, then we'll move on, if that's okay, Gail. Thank you. There are still 43 uh, flats. Yeah. There were only 23 car parking spaces. Have they been increased? Have you done anything about that? We've, t we've tweaked the parking to increase the provision of a car parking space for the residential units. It's still not one for one at the moment, it's around 0.7. We've retained the full amount of pay and display car parking. I have to emphasise that's just the current proposal. It may change again from now until we get to submission. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Association but also Surrey representative on the South East England Forum for Ageing. My concern is the number of facilities that are threatened by Transform Leatherhead. First of all, we were threatened with the loss of the day centre. We've won that one, and that's been taken out of what might have been new parking arrangements. We are now threatened with the viability of the theatre with the proposal that we should have a cinema, and the latest gossip, I hope, is that the development of the Red House grounds will include the loss of Park House. Just pick that one up? Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, quite a lot to respond to there. Um, we, as we've said earlier, as Simon said earlier in the presentation, we're working with Cushman and Wakefield 
um, a leading retail and leisure specialist who are advising us. And in fact, one of the things that they're presently working on is doing a study to um, ensure that there will be no negative impact on the theatre if we do indeed bring forward an element of cinema usage within the Swan Centre master plan. That's the long-term objective that we've got for the Swan Centre. So we are very keen to ensure that whatever we do in, within the Swan Centre does not negatively impact on the very building that we're sat in because we fully appreciate that this has a very valid role to play within the town centre and indeed our community. And we are liaising closely with the theatre. So we're not doing this in isolation um, very much. And we have got no intention of taking away any valued um, community service. And in fact, one of the things that we're very keen to see incorporated within Bull Hill, and we've yet to formalise our final plan, is enhanced community services within that, because we think that that would be a suitable location. So we're very keen to allay those fears. Okay. So we've got a lady in the front row. At the back as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not so much a question, more a comment. I know I've heard a lot of people have negative opinions on the introduction of a cinema in Leatherhead. Yeah. As somebody who has lived here my entire life, apart from that week I spent at Netsman Hostel when I was born, <laughs> and being 31... Mm, <laughs> <laughs> <Make a note. laughs> Thanks. During those years where I wanted to go and seek out, and even still now, I find myself having to travel to other towns. When I was a teenager, I had to spend my time in Guildford, Kingston, Epsom, because the provisions weren't here in Leatherhead. I think if we offered a, a cinema that was, we're not suggesting, I don't think, something as large as the Odeon and Epsom, something respectful to the size of area that we're talking about, it's offering something completely different to the Leatherhead Theatre and the service it's providing, but it's opening up a load of opportunity for the young people and providing entertainment that is not available in Leatherhead at the moment and we consistently have to travel to. And with the increase in rail fare, et cetera, that's adding additional costs on those entertainments. So just from what I wanted to say was that people my age and younger, it's, it's supported and we understand it's going to be done respectfully. I think the popularity of the open air cinema that happened this summer sort of goes to show that there is a requirement for that sort of provision within this area that we're completely lacking. So. Well, thank you very, very much for that. Um, I think there's, a, there's also a line of thought that, you know, our advisors are speaking to the market out there all the time. And in fact, we've got four um, cinema operators who are very, very keen to come into town. And the sheer fact that they are so keen to be engaging with us and seriously engaging as well actually says that they have identified that there is an opportunity. So what we've got to do is make sure that we get the, sc the scale of it right and the fit right for Leverhead. And it will have a positive contribution to pay. Thank you. Uh, so there's a lady at the back. Uh, Gail, can you get... Yes. <laughs> I think Mike's just coming round to you now. around the whole area filled in and are the cycle paths going to be opened up so they're actually usable? So your question relates to potholes and cycle paths, I believe. So can I ask perhaps Richard or Colin to pick that one up on our behalf? <coughs> I think the pot... The feedback. Um, I think the pothole question um, is an interesting one. Um, it is one that I get everywhere I go, as you can imagine. If I turn up at a place, potholes is always at the top of the agenda. Um, it is a, a problem we face in Surrey, and network is underfunded. Um, we are managing a deteriorating network and doing our best with it, and the last winter didn't help. Actually, we've invested over £20 million in trying to get our roads better. It is, a, it is a, an ongoing battle. We will never have enough money and time to do it all. 
but we are actually on top of the back on top of the situation. We did lose control of it over the winter because of the sheer size of it. I ho openly admit that. My officer's probably going to kick me under the table, but you know we did lose a little bit of control of it over the winter period, surely because of the size of it and the weather we had. But we are back in control of it. We do go around and repair. As long as they are reported on the Surrey website and not on some of the apps that are available because that information doesn't come to us, we will react within the timescales that are on the website. So I do apologise, but we, 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 are back on in, we are back on top of it and we are managing it and they are being repaired where they've been reported. Name it if then by all means please do send by all means please do send me a pothole that you say haven't been repaired in five years. E please do email me the details. We won't have a public conversation about a single pothole. Oh cycle path. Do you know where I'm not sure about that you said about cycle paths being opened up and I'm not sure is there ones that are closed? Um, again, I, I can't talk about individual cycle paths. We do invest what we can in them, but at, like the situation with the roads, you know, there isn't enough money to do it all. Um, we are doing what we can and investing. Again, bring them items up at the local committee. They're the, they're the board that actually are highlight these local issues and actually have the funding to do something about where we can or get into bids to actually bring some money in through the LEPs who will be with us tonight who do fund some of the uh, repairs and maintenance and... Um, and improvements of cycle paths through an area. Can I, can I just add, if I, if I may, <clears throat> to the question of the potholes? Um, I, I hear what you say about we've lost it for five years. I, I, I would possibly challenge that, but just to give you a bit of context, um, early in the year, we had over 30 gangs working on the network fixing potholes. We dealt with approximately 50,000 last year. It's a continual problem, but we're very pleased about the additional investment the County Council is making to, to tackle the problems of severe weather and the 12 million this year and the additional 8 million next year that Councillor Kemp's mentioned. But what I would say to you, if you actually you know, if you look on our website, you will see the roads that we're tackling, and there are hundreds of roads that we're tackling specifically to deal with the pothole issues. And I'll just re-emphasise, if you, if you could report them, if you see them on our website, it would be very much appreciated. Any of that are reported that uh, meet our criteria are, are dealt with in time. At the moment, we, we, are, we are dealing with all potholes within our, within our time frame, and that depends on the category. But it can be anything from five days to, to 28 days. I just say I'd encourage you to put, put them forward. Thank you. And there, can I just add to that? There is a slight difference between what you're calling a pothole and a road in poor condition. That's not necessarily a pothole. We, we, you know, even if you gave me a £50 million check today, I would not be able to repair all the roads in Surrey that need it. It would take me 15 years, otherwise I would bring Surrey to a standstill. So we know there are roads in poor condition, but that's a different conversation to where there are potholes. Where they meet safety defects, um, we will go in and, re and, repair and carry out repairs and we are doing a lot of large-scale passing and resurfacing to actually make a lot of the, the main roads through the areas um, that have been highlighted by your local councillors um, and to get, to get them back up to standards. Thank you. Yep. So the mic's on its way to the gentleman with the jacket. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I've got a body shop car repairs in uh, Epsom mm -hmm. and... Um, it's very shaky ground. What's going to happen with that? It's probably going to be developed as everything does. I've heard you all speak tonight about you know, the high street and everything, which I understand you need a good high street centre. But I've heard nothing about encouraging businesses to come. I've been looking in this area mm -hmm. for two years now. If I can find somewhere that is suitable, that I can afford, they're not interested. There's a big discrimination against body shops, car industry. So what would you do to encourage me and help me to bring my business to Leatherhead? So we adopted the economic prosperity strategy in March and through that we have additional funding in place and we use that to buy a product called CoStar which enables us to run a search of all the um, available vacant premises in our district. So if you are happy to get in contact with the economic development team um, or you can contact me directly. Um, we can undertake that search on your behalf. 
I appreciate there are sometimes planning issues with certain sites that are not suitable. It may not be within your budget, but let's have that conversation and see what we can do because we would welcome anybody who brings employment into our, into our towns. And can I, can, can I, if yeah. I may add to that, I have sympathy. I spent my whole life in a motor trade, so I know exactly where you're coming from, main dealer and independent trader. But a, a lot of what Jonathan was talking about tonight, about encouraging the micro and the small businesses, is the work that Costa Capital is really encourages in our area. Because actually it's been highlighted, like you said, that there is an issue, and they're working with all the areas in, in the east of Surrey to actually make that more feasible, bring the businesses in, because we need the employment. Generating of town centres is, really is really possible and really important as well, but encouraging business, it's all got to be all done together. And so that work, I can, I'm a part of a lot of those conversations, and probably representing you as well as a lot of other independent traders, but a lot of small businesses as well, because I'm really sympathetic for that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are schemes like that, like the apprenticeship scheme, um, working in conjunction with local colleges. Um, again, we can help provide information around that if you're not already. There are uh, Brighton. Brighton on the coast, Northbrook, Brighton Met, they all specialise in automotive. Um, I was at an apprenticeship fair last night, in fact, where they were there presenting. Um, it obviously, it means that your employees who are taking up those roles and an apprenticeship in that field would have to travel, and that's obviously an issue. Um, but by means, let's have that conversation for offline and see what we can do. And again, the LEPs are engaging with the further education departments. I'm like, I'm an I was an apprentice, that's how I started my life, and a lot of work going on now and conversations to identify what trades and what industries need apprentices and need trainees, and not necessarily people going to university, but actually training in core skills that actually we need as well. So them conversations, again, I can assure you, are going on. They're not going to happen overnight, but that work is, it has been identified as an area that needs addressing and is being challenged and taken forward. Thank you. There's, um, Jeremy Webb's got a question, I think. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Um, a lot has been talked about uh, improving retail and leisure in the town, um, but there's an alternative point of view um, that says that in looking at what is in the town, we should be thinking about what people actually need, as in what they have to have mm -hmm. and what they don't have. So up the road, we have um, an NHS facility in Leatherhead Hospital, which we are perhaps lucky to have, but it's in the middle of a residential area. Um, it's a, a very old site, and no doubt the NHS would love to have a, a much more modern facility. Um, and perhaps we could do with having it in the centre of town and then they could um, turn what is a residential area into a residential area as well. And if you imagine the number of people who need to access NHS facilities, bringing them into town brings a really good um, bit of cross fertilisation for everything yeah. else that's in town. So services that are needed by the community should be bang in the centre. So bring the library, for example, yeah. into the centre. It's, you know, that where it is probably doesn't get the traffic that it would have if it was in the centre. It, it could easily be upstairs, um, particularly if there was a lift um, serving it. Um, you know, I don't know whether the Swan Centre is thinking about a third and fourth floor, mm -hmm. but, you know, there are lots of ways of doing these things. And um, perhaps the Red Hill Red House site would uh, would be good for a yeah. big we, health facility. We are, you can see us nodding yeah, away. Yeah, we we're definitely we thinking vision. along the same lines, sir. Yeah, yeah very yeah. much so. Another one, going back to a workshop um, at uh, Pitbrook um, when uh, business from all over the place was asked to think about the plan. Um, the one thing that Mole Valley doesn't have is a further education institution. Now, one might need to question whether there is sufficient, would be sufficient support in terms of students to attend an institution. But the moment you start concentrating on business skills, core skills, I'd argue that there could be merit. And again, 
something bang in the centre of town would bring people in. Yeah, yeah. yeah we completely agree. And we are, we are looking and considering all the things that you've um, outlined. And it, it furthers um, what we were talking about in response to the lady uh, to, the, to my right, um, her question. Um, we do think that Ball Hill might well be the right location for that enhanced community element and indeed maybe an element within the Swan Centre as well. Yeah, going back to uh, Clare House and James House, um, with a private sector partner taking uh, the planning application and development ahead, uh, I wonder how the council will ensure the high quality of the development is, is not diminished in that process and also the, making sure the finishes are long lasting, etc. So um, how that's achieved is by ensuring that any detailed plan application is subject to our approval as landowner before it goes through for consideration by the local planning authority. So that's how we would achieve that level of control. Thank you for your question. I think I've, seen, a, sorry. I've seen that work in other, in our, I work around with all the 11 boroughs and districts and it does work. It does work where a borough and district can be the landowner, get a developer in, make sure the quality of what's delivered is right for what their area needs. And it works, I assure you it does. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady in the front with the hand up. And Mike's just on its way to you. Encouraged by the um, title, Transform Leatherhead. Um, my question really is that I was wondering why Transform Leatherhead was only directed towards the town centre. And um, obviously there's some places like where Tesco's is that could do with um, more investment. That's my question. So I think um, North Leatherhead in particular is recognised as having needs and challenges. And although Transform Leatherhead is focused on the town centre, it's about providing something which offers something for all the different segments of the community. So we're working very hard to deliver that. We have other teams within, within the council, not within my team, who specialise more within um, looking at how we can enhance North Leatherhead they are unfortunately not here tonight, but if you've got specific questions, please do contact me and we'll get you in touch with the right people who can talk to you more about what we're trying to achieve across the council. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady in the middle row there with her hand up. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Susan. I'm sorry. I've been toying with asking you this all evening, but I'm just going to go for it. First of all, I just want to thank you all so much for your hard work. I would not want your job. <laughs> I would not want it at all. I, a lot of this is over my head completely, um, but I love Leatherhead. I've been here for 11 years. I'm not from around these parts, but I have been here for 11 years. Um, and particularly North Leatherhead is a concern of mine. And so I'm just one of many voices um, who, who love that part of our community and feel quite strongly that it's worth investing in. And um, I'm just going to give the mic to my husband for a second whilst I show you something that we've made. My question yeah. is... Can it's we upside down. Yeah, it is. <laughs> One percent of £240 million. Pounds. Mm -hmm. Can we have 1%? So, can we get a mic to Susan? Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Susan Leverett from the Leatherhead Resident Association. Um, the petition referred to before was the business position a petition signed by 99 businesses and civic organizations around. In addition to that, we have 800 signatures of users, that is, employees and, and shoppers uh, on the high street, which we've collected in the last three or four weeks, mm -hmm. which we would like taken into consideration. And, and then a, a, a question for Colin and Richard. Um, are there any other towns our size in Surrey which have a pedestrian zone with no waiting both before and after, meaning that at no time during the day are we allowed to 
stop on the street and turn the engine off? I can, you can answer. I'll let Richard answer that bit. Okay, Richard. I'll answer, I'll, I'll answer from a different point of view. I can name you three towns that want to pedestrianise their town centre to actually create a place. And, I'd, you know, and I'll speak as an individual and not as a Surrey County Councillor. I'm not a highways expert. Richard is. And I read this petition because I was given it a week or so ago knowing I was coming here. I urge you really to think about that because actually creating a through traffic in a pedestrian zone That's does irrelevant. not... Yeah, That's which I would. What other towns do is up to them. And we're talking about Leatherhead and you, Councillor, in Leatherhead tonight. Could we allow the question to be responded to, and we'll pick up your further question afterwards? Thank you. Creating the, and I would like you to think about actually creating people the ability to come in by car and then go to one shop and go out doesn't create footfall, and footfall is what you need. But Leatherhead is an individual, and I don't pretend to know it. And Richard may be able to ask if there's any other, if you know of any towns where that take where there is that facility at the moment? Yeah, I'm just racking my brains because uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know the ins and outs of each individual town, but um, Epsom is probably of a similar size level, I think, and that became... No, sorry, 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 I apologise. Egham, I meant to say Egham. Egham is of a similar size to Leatherhead. Okay, well, you clearly know more about Egham than I do. Yeah. But I know that Egham is pedestrianised during the day and it's of a similar size to, to Leatherhead. That was the example that came to my mind. But it's something I can certainly look up and um, have a conversation with you outside of, outside of this forum. We would, never, we would never, as a matter of beauty or saving the planet or anything like that, we would never want cars to be able to park on the high street. It's just a matter that the businesses who've invested their money there cannot make a decent profit. I mean, obviously with exceptions, but many, many businesses struggle because of lack of footfall. And when, when, before 2006, when we did have uh, free parking after the pedestrian zone ended, business was okay. We, you know, we made profits. And afterwards, not. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. So there's a gentleman just by you there, Gail. We will try to get round to everybody. Bear with us. Uh, thank you for turning up tonight. Uh, much appreciated in your spare time. Um, two points I want to make. One is there have been su successful transformations. I refer to New York, Toronto, Antwerp, that's in Belgium, and lots of other places. Uh, I was wondering whether the consultant who is advising you actually had those projects on their list of capability. Not only that, but these big projects were successful, as they say, in a post-democratic society, which basically meant that the planning was done by a team consisting of people like yourselves, people from the public, and specialists, and it was chaired by an independent facilitator. Now, maybe this is food for thought. The last thing I just want to mention is that I got the impression that the pedestrian survey was done in June this year. Now, June was hardly the peak of, if you like, the school period. I live at St. John's Avenue, so I see exactly how much, how many people, uh, pupils uh, and commuters actually go down Park Rise. I've lived here for over 30 years. I've been traveling that route for a long, long time. And it's still impossible to get from Park Rise top, or from Swanset, for that matter, to the station safely. You now, traffic is so bad, you have to put up your hand, stop the traffic on Kingston Road to actually to try and get across safely. Not only that, but after some rain, you need Wellington boots. And only in Leatherhead, actually, water is required to go uphill. The problem being, it's not potholes, but it's lack of maintenance of the drains where the station is. And the railway people who actually have the car park on the top, actually, they are polluting one of the drains. They're not even complying with water discharge legislation. Now, let's get the detail right as well of us who are suffering potholes and big puddles 
before you actually, you know, finalise on transforming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Was there a, I'm not sure if there was a question there we can particularly answer. Obviously, we've, we've heard the concerns you've raised. You mentioned the timing of the um, transport, transport data collection. We did it in June because it was before the summer holiday, so it was intended to be relatively representative of normal traffic conditions through the, through the, through the, through the year. True, but in terms of that took out perhaps two school years, but in terms of as a generalisation, it's broadly representative and it's just used as a baseline to enable us to do some modelling work. It's not meant to be a definitive representation of all the traffic flows fall ahead. It's just a, a starting point. But if we need to repeat some aspects of data collection to make sure the model is valid, then we will, we will do so. Okay. Uh, there's a gentleman up there with his jacket on. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. I, I don't doubt your sincerity on this project, and neither do I doubt your enthusiasm. And I thank you for a wonderful presentation this evening. You, you've done an excellent job. Um, my concerns, basically, as a Leatherhead resident and, um, and council taxpayer, is that the council is going into the property business. Whereas when I grew up, the council looked after clearing the rubbish and collecting the taxes. And, and this is quite a sea change to go into a business for which you may or may not have uh, any experience. But as a property owner myself, uh, I can assure you that renting property successfully is not the easiest thing in the world. And I think you've probably noticed that with your foray into the high street with the two properties that have stood there empty for probably four, five, six months, I could be corrected on this. Um, the one thing that worried me slightly was when you said to this gentleman down here, it's the price you want to pay. And in property, you can rent anything if you set the right rent. And having had two empty properties in Leatherhead, uh, which, of course, the, the, the public purse is, is, um, is, is not benefiting uh, from that. Um, you're now going on to build this huge development down by the river, uh, which could or could not be subjected to um, floods. Uh, you're going to be looking for tenants to, uh, to uh, rent a restaurant and possibly other businesses. And you're going to be looking to people to either buy or to rent flats, as I understand it, 23 of which don't have parking spaces. Uh, and I wonder really if you're really in the right business here. So, thank, thank you. Um, to try and pick up on the various issues that you've raised. So, Mole Valley District Council, like many other local authorities, has always had significant land holdings, has in fact been the business of managing those assets for as long as it's been in existence. Um, we have a highly experienced property team, professionally qualified surveyors. Every acquisition we do is on the basis of a fully researched business case. In respect of 2123 High Street, we factored into the business appraisal, the, the, the business case, that there would be a void period because we knew that we would need to do some works, particularly to 21 High Street, because it had stood empty for so long and has suffered from significant water ingress as a result of the want of repair by its previous owner. I think in terms of um, how we are taking these significant projects forward, we absolutely recognise the risk of the public purse, which is why we are seeking to take on board a delivery partner. So those risks are not borne by the council taxpayer. They are in fact shared with a private sector partner or even a public sector partner, depending on the nature of the particular project. So I'd just like to reassure you really that we have the depth of experience where we need professional advice, we take it, and we don't look to take on all the risk ourselves. We recognise we don't have the resource and experience in all these fields, and therefore we look to take on the appropriate delivery partner who has that depth of uh, experience and who shares or takes on those risks. And with regard to the car parking element that you referred to at Clare and James House, it's 43 units. There will be 30 spaces which are allocated to the residential units at the moment. 23 pay and display spaces, which replicates what's on site at the moment, plus an additional uh, disabled uh, space in the pay and display car park. 
So, in effect, as it stands at the moment, there will be 13 residential units that don't have an allocated parking space if we take into consideration the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 spaces per unit ratio. So, I know our dance troupe is kind of, we've got time, so we, our dance troupe is ready to uh, entertain us this evening. I think we've got time for one or maybe two more questions. Uh, yep, so we've got a lady in the front row. Or second to front row. Um, a very quick question to Simon. Um, you mentioned the ramp sculpture um, tiled area. I can't really describe what it is. <laughs> you, you mentioned it was going to be renovated. Could you let us know when and um, what, what, how, how is it going to be restored? Uh, my understanding is that. Uh, am I on? Yeah. Is this working? There you are. Now, good. My understanding is the answer to that is as soon as we can get it organised. Um, now, in council speak, that probably means sometime in the next month or so. And uh, it, we're, we're not looking to do anything fancy with it. It's, it's a remedial measure to make sure that it's tidied up and it's safe. Hopefully, it will look a little bit more attractive by the time it's been finished. But it's, it's, we're not going to replace the, uh, the, the tiles with, with, with light material. It, it, it's a rendering surface to as I say, make it safe and tidy um, while we factor it then into the longer term view as to what the public realm should look like. In fact, what that particular piece of the road should look like. Should it be a road? Should it be retained as it currently is? That again all comes out of the public realm and the transport uh, study that, that we're, we're undertaking. Yep, so thank you. Oh, hello. I have a question in relation to the uh, Bull Hill development. I'm concerned about the potential loss of parkland there, which actually I find is one of the nicest aspects when you come into the town from the station. Um, I feel that that space, given a bit of love, could be similar to Priory Park or, or the park in Dorking that's recently been redeveloped. So I ask... Um, I, I just would like to know what is the prospective future for the, the parkland and will that be retained? Thank you. So I think this matter has come up at the, at the last forum as well and um, the message is that we haven't got any plans at the moment for, the, for master planning the Bull Hill site. We absolutely recognise the importance of green space as part of a, a healthy town centre so we'll bear that in mind when we look at how we lay out <coughs> that part of the town centre. As I said, we think it'll be a mixed-use scheme. Um, once we've completed the Swan Centre assessment and the transport work, we'll be able to start bringing forward the ideas for that part of the town centre, but absolutely hear what you say. Thank you. So I'm really sorry to everybody who wanted to ask a question tonight and we've not had a chance to get to them. Um, you should have question cards with you this evening. Please do take a few moments to, to write, to, to fill them in. Any questions you submit, we will get back to you in writing and we'll publish responses on our website for everybody to see. Um, before we close this part of the evening, thank you again for uh, coming and raising the questions. We do appreciate your feedback and I think at this point we need to hand over to our dance troupe. Can, can, I, can I just say one, one little sentence quickly? Just to say... Um, I'm really encouraged by coming here and reading this document and listening to the, the engagement that Mole Valley are doing with Leatherhead. Our retail centres are changing. Retail itself is changing. And actually, we need to create places that people can engage with. Green spaces, we've seen some really good plans on here, where places where people can relax. Coffee shops, restaurants, play centres, theatres, cinemas. It's not just retail. You must create places. Mole Valley are really forward thinking. You've got a great uh, lo a local council here that's really engaging with partners and trying its best with limited resources to deliver. And I just wanted to stand here in public and actually say that um, to, to you all. So I think they need some encouragement. Change is always difficult. They're never going to keep everybody on board. Not everyone's going to agree with what's going on, but change is important. There's no such thing as standing still. You either got to move forward and change, or you go backwards. And we've seen some high streets, if you drive around the country, that are going backwards very fast. And Leatherhead, I'm pleased to say, is not one of them. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Um, as Emma has said, we're now onto the 
the bit of the evening where Dandelions uh, Dance Squad, uh, they're from the, the Dandelion Theatre Arts and they're based here in the, in the theatre. I'm told that they're going to be providing a, a performance of mixed dance styles. Uh, so uh, it would be lovely if everybody could stay and, and watch that. It's, it's a great way to finish the evening off. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, do fill your forms in. Do tell us what you think. Do ask us questions. Uh, I'll shut up and let you get on with it. Thank you very much.